I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today we're going to go and do something in a slightly different format. We're going to have a debate. Uh, this happened a couple of months ago when we were still recording face-to-face when you were, were still in the U.S. I made a comment about uh, creativity and China's education system and Chinese culture. And, Specifically uh, with reference to the Nobel Prize. Right. You had mentioned that the, that there one of the reasons you you just mentioned off the hand you weren't making a firm point you just said that one of the reasons that people think that or some people think that China doesn't have more Nobels is because uh, of their education system and, and, I, and it, the 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 problem with creativity right 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 and I remember thinking and and I did not respond well to that because what I heard was <laughs> you, you China blew up totally on me. Well, it was funny because <laughs> what I heard was China does not deserve to win Nobels because their schools suck. And but I was that's like, not what I said. What? That's not I know. what I said, right? Well, okay. and it's interesting because at the time you had, I think you had specified or you thought you were specifying science, not literature. I heard literature and I was like, what? Anyway, that's a long story. The short version of the story is it ended up being a more interesting discussion about creativity or actually more like innovation in Chinese culture generally. Yeah. So that's kind of what we're going to debate today is whether or not There is something in Chinese culture that militates against innovation. And and we had that debate after the podcast, and we we thought it was interesting enough that we should bring it on to the podcast. Because even though we're not specifically talking about, uh, you know, Nobel Prizes in literature or anything like that, it it does touch on a lot of things that come out of literature, right? Right, right. Sort of creativity in general— and it is very timely because if you ever spend any time in China, you're probably going to hear a conversation about the Nobel Prize thing. Like China produces so many great stuff, so many great people, so much great stuff. Why do they never win Nobel Prizes? That sort of thing. We should probably jump right in, right? I, I kind of think we already have. <laughs> All right. So so my point is that there is a discourse in Chinese culture, and, and I want to make sure this is clear. It's not some essential Chinese quality. It's a choice that, that Chinese thinkers have made over the past thousand years since the really the Song dynasty to not promote creativity or innovation. This is not something that is all that different from medieval Europe. Uh, Essentially, everything is about imitation. Uh, and imitation is some is a goal to strive for. Now, this was true in Europe probably before, uh, really before the Romantics. And in China, you have writers like Huang Tingjian, who is a Song Dynasty writer, who says, you know, Han Yu and uh, Du Fu. So Han Yu is the greatest Tang Dynasty essayist, and Du Fu is is one of the great, arguably the greatest Chinese Tang poet. And Huang Tingjian said that neither of them ever wrote anything new. That is, they never came up with a new phrase in all of their writings. They actually were copying the ancients and just recycling or reusing things that the ancients had already said. Su Shi also said something similar. Su Shi, as I'm sure listeners will remember, is uh, one of the great Song Dynasty poets. We did, how many podcasts did we do on him, Rob? Two, I believe two. Su Shi said this. I'm just going to read the Chinese and then I'll translate it. Uh, so that's all of the great achievements in the world have already been completed. And I'm getting that translation from Wang Yugun's 10,000 Scrolls, page 64. Rob, you know Wang Yugun. You've taken a class with him. Right? Taken a couple with him. Independent study, too. Yeah, he's a, an expert on the, the Song Dynasty. The point is that these Song Dynasty thinkers were so enamored with the Tang Dynasty that they thought that imitating the Tang dynasty was the thing to do. Everything great had already been said by the Tang or earlier, the the ancient writers like Confucius, and that there was no need to be creative. The thing to do was to just focus on being as much like the greats as possible. And I, my argument is simply this, that today that still there still is a lingering sense of what Su Shi and Huang Tingjian argued in China today. The The thing to do is not to be creative or to be innovative, but it's to just do what the ancients have already perfected and, and try your best to be like them. Now, keep in mind, the Song Dynasty, they had some amazing innovative poetry, but in general, they rarely claimed that it was innovative does that does that make sense rob am i just it does it does but that's a good place to stop because my 
question then was going to be, how are you distinguishing between what is and is not innovative? Because there are so many things written in Western literature after the Romantics when they were claiming to innovate that really weren't very innovative at all. They called them that, but they weren't particularly innovative. They were borrowing some of the same rhyme schemes. Even the stuff that's pretending to be utterly revolutionary, avant-garde poetry, the imagists in France, for example, or you get into the 20th century and you get really, really crazy stuff happening. It only works because you're consciously calling up older thinkers and telling people, I'm not that. But in one way or the other, you you still rely on the ancients. There's no such thing as pure innovation. Like I'm doing something that literally has never been done before. So how are you qualifying innovation? I take your point. Uh, It's really hard to quantify innovation. And if you're going to make this claim that uh, there is more of this in other parts of the world compared to China, you have to have some sort of data that, that is kind of you have to have numbers, right? What I would say is that the Nobel Prize kind of functions in that way. I don't think it's a perfect measurement, but you do have very few Chinese thinkers who have won Nobel Prizes. I mean, just to date, you've had one scientist, Tuyoyo, who she won a Nobel, I think in 2015, for her uh, research on malaria. That's the only citizen of the PRC that's ever won a scientific Nobel Prize. Now, there have been ethnic Chinese who have left China, and there have been members of the Republic of China, citizens of the Republic of China, who have won Nobel Prizes. And so it's not an argument about some some sort of essentialized notion of Chineseness and, and that Chinese people as a group can't innovate. It's that there is a discourse that's uh, very common in Chinese society, specifically mainland China, that makes it hard to think in terms of innovation. And there was one scientist, Wang Yuju, he was a physicist at uh, CAS in Shanghai, one of the premier research institutes. He started out five years ahead of Stephen Chu in terms of trapping atoms using laser cooling techniques. He didn't really pursue his idea because he had never been taught that innovation was important. And I'm not, I'm not, this is not me saying this. This is a, a paper that Rob, you and I read before, before we did this podcast uh, by Cao Kong called uh, Chinese Science and the Nobel Prize Complex. So because he kind of dragged his feet and also he had trouble getting funding, he actually ended up not doing what Stephen Chu did until about a year after Stephen Chu and his team had already done it. He published his paper in 1993, a year behind what Stephen Chu did. So even though Wang Yu Chu was five years ahead of Stephen Chu starting out, because he wasn't focused on innovation, because that culturally just wasn't as important to him as Stephen Chu, who, although he's ethnic Chinese, was uh, born and raised in the U.S., Stephen Chu ended up winning this Nobel Prize and getting this research done faster than Wang Yuju. I want to point out here, since we're talking about creativity generally, not just in the sciences, because if this is a science debate, then we've got a different kind of podcast. To date, there have been seven Nobel Prize winners in literature, not from Europe, the United States, or Russia. Seven in over 120 years of Nobel Prizes. Now, what's interesting to me is that when I ask you about innovation, it's a it's a it's kind of a chimera. You, you can't define it. No one can really define it. We we have sort of arbitrary things like this Nobel Prize, but when it comes down to just pure creativity, and that's how I'm going to think about literature, because uh, you can just sit alone in a room and write literature. Science requires some sort of institutional investment. I can't just win the Nobel Prize for physics with a notepad. I have to have investment, which then also requires coming up with a plan that's going to interest investors, which means finding something they're going to invest in, which is usually something like a Nobel Prize. If you can't qualify it, if you can't define it, then saying that China does not encourage innovation is saying that China doesn't encourage the kind of innovation you personally think is innovative. I didn't say I can't define it. I, I would go I would go back to the definition of pornography, which is I, I can't, it's very hard to define, but I can tell you when I see it. Okay, so that's but now we're we're getting into a purely subjective thing, which would be my point that one of the reasons that China is seen as uninnovative is because we have a very particular definition or an appreciation of what's innovative, which is almost always distance from what came before it. So it's innovative 
if it consciously breaks with whatever has come before it. So if you have a new way of using something old, that's not innovative. That's just calling back to something old. So in Western terms of Western appreciation of creativity has very little room for things like tradition and taking what has come before it and adapting it. That's not creative or innovative and it's not rewarded. I would just, I would, I just want to uh, uh, qualify that a bit. I think when you use the term West, that's actually too broad of a term. I would say it the is. post-romantic West. Okay, fair right? enough. Because that, yep. that attitude that China has today that, and this is the point I was kind of, I think, inelegantly making at the beginning of the podcast, is that China, the attitude in China today that militates against innovation. Oh man, I love using that term militate. Militate. Yeah, you're good. You're in your final <laughs> stages of grad school, my friend. Words like that are just <laughs> everywhere. Um the so the the kind of militating against innovation, that thinking that is in China is something that was in the West before before, you know, Wordsworth and I guess sure. you can call Goethe a, a, a Yeah, you were judged era. somewhat by, at least in the classical era by how well you could call back to Homer. Or, I mean, um, that's what neoclassical, the neoclassical yeah, era is, right? Sure, sure. Um, but let's let's you know let's use your example of Du Fu. Huang Tingjian goes, yeah, Du Fu never really wrote anything original. He just drew off of the ancients, right? And that um, was a plus for for Huang Tingjian. He was saying that's why Du Fu is great. Fair enough. But to see that as uninnovative means that if you can take things that came before and use them in a way that's either never been combined before or is very, very, I'm going to use the word new. Uh, that's not innovative. Innovative has to be a complete break, but there's no such thing as a complete break ever. No matter how avant-garde or weird, there's always a connection to what came before it and always a conscious connection to what came before it. So I, I, I want to uh, push back against that a little. I'm not saying that Chinese folks weren't being innovative in, when they were participating in this discourse. What I'm saying is that what they do what Su Shi, what Huang Tingjian do is that they frame what they are doing as uninnovative. Whether or not they are being innovative is to a certain degree irrelevant. It's more about how they're framing it. So they think of what they're doing as uninnovative. They think of what they're doing as kind of imitative. And because of that, that actually makes it much more difficult to do things that are Innovative. Now, I, I also want to get back to a point you mentioned that you know there are uh, very few people uh, outside of Europe and the U.S. who win Nobel prizes in in literature, implying that the uh, the Nobel Prize is Eurocentric. I think that's absolutely true. the The Nobel Prize is Eurocentric. That I mean, I think the number of Swedes who've won it is is <laughs> considering the size yeah considering the size of sweden's population is is really high and i you know everybody understands that that probably has something to do with the fact that the nobel prize is awarded awarded in sweden and there is a i believe a fairly large contingent of swedish speakers on the committee there is a kind of cultural claim that the nobel prize is is biased against other parts of the world i think that's 100% totally fair even though i think that the nobel prize does a uh does try to get out of that eurocentric framework they don't always do it super well um so that's clearly one of the reasons why no chinese writer before moyan has ever won the nobel prize but current you know, Moyen, citizen of china we should point out Gaoxin yeah won sorry in 2000 Gaoxin, thank you yeah and i guess uh liu Xiao won the Nobel Prize for Peace, Peace Prize. He yeah. himself was a, a a writer. Yeah. So I want to throw this in because, um, and I'm going to see if I can frame this, this question a little better. What you're claiming is that the discourse within China is that not only, or at least historically was, not only are we not innovative, we're not trying to be because that's not something to, to that's not a virtue. That's not a cultural virtue. Virtue is how you're connected to what came before you not how you're breaking from it. Am, am I putting that well? You said it much better than I ever could. Well, I usually do. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, what's interesting, though, is that there is that discourse, and now your follow-up is that's why there's not as much innovation in China. My counterpoint would be there's a problematic way that the, that the post-romantic West – 
asserts its own notion of innovation because it is, we are doing what no one that came before us has done. This is really interesting in the arts because when you have something like the novel form, for example, when you have something, a writer like Proust, for example, or not just Proust, let's just do James Joyce uh, as a kind of an extreme example, who's doing something that is consciously against pretty much any kind of novel that came before it. But the only way it works is if everyone knows what came before it. It, it. It's not innovative in the sense that it's totally new because it's completely connected to all the stuff that came before it, at least generically. There's literally nothing new under the sun. It's still a novel. People still recognize it as a novel. It's still going to have a beginning and an end. It's still going to have protagonists. It's still going to have all the forms there. And what's interesting is that the way that's if defining that is innovation is limiting an appreciation of what another culture might be doing in terms of simply passing on what came before it. Maybe. I, I, I think I mostly agree with what you're saying. I mean, you're, you're saying that the sort of Ezra Pound notion of make it new that came around in early modernism is contingent upon everybody knowing what came before so you know how this is new, right? Sort of. I think my, my follow-up point, though, would be, it's not to counter what you were saying, it is not that... You, you can't read Joyce and, and see how what he's doing is completely new unless you've already read Homer, which Joyce right. is, is, is literally... I mean, he's, he's very clearly alluding to. He calls his novel Ulysses. Uh, Leopold Bloom is based off of the character of Ulysses, and he's kind of... He's countering Ulysses, right? So, so I, I think my point, though, then, would be... Uh, how do we judge whether or not China is being innovative? Because if our point is, here's innovation. It's something new. It's something consciously new. We're going to reward creativity, et cetera. What we're actually rewarding is fairly contrived and not actually innovation at all, at least the way we're thinking about how we're defining it. It has a lot more in common with what China's doing and has always done than we like to admit because China is passing on what came before. China is consciously referencing past writings, past scholarship. I remember as a, being a master's degree student in Nankai and and uh, talking to a, a classmate of mine, and she said, you know, in China, a good thesis is judged to be something like 20% your own work, 80% other people's work. Stand on I the would, shoulders of giants, right? Yeah, well, I would argue that the West is not that dissimilar. The difference is that people try to say that that's not what's happening, and that causes them then to say, see, there's no innovation in China. People aren't innovating. They're just copying what came before them. When in fact, we may not be copying necessarily what came before us, but we are absolutely drawing off of it and then pretending we're not. Sure. I, I, I think we're kind of splitting hairs here, and I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. What I would what I would say is that having an attitude where you think uh, imitation is more important than innovation changes how you do things. It changes how you think about things in science where, you know, just being a year ahead of someone qualifies you as the innovator rather than the, the sort of laggard. That is a as close to an objective measure as we're going to get. And, and it's not just me who's saying this, you know, Chinese scientists or ethnically Chinese scientists have have made similar claims. Uh, so Chen Ningyang said he, he would not have uh, won the Nobel Prize if he had returned to the PRC in the 1950s. Now, part of that was because of politics, because, uh, you know, China in the 1950s eventually cut itself off from the rest of the world, and he would not have known uh, the debates about the law of conservation of parity. Uh, but... But I still think that there there are these ethnically Chinese scientists who are studying in the U.S., who are studying in Europe. They are saying, you know, we, you just can't, it's very difficult to do innovative work in the PRC. And I think part of that comes down to a discourse. So it's it's not just me who's making this claim. It's, it's uh, uh, participants in this world. What's well, interesting, though, when you read enough of the Chinese classics, imitation, it seems to me that, that it's defined a little differently or approached a little differently because it's never pure imitation. There's always innovation involved. If Dufu really is just using what came before him, he's doing it in a way that no one who came before him ever did, just as James Joyce is taking a novel form and doing with it what no one who came before him ever did. 
I, I think ahead. we can kind of go back and forth over imitation and whether or not it's really imitation. I just, a couple of things as we try and wrap this up, I, I wanted to point out. So Dufu, as far as I know, he never made the claim that he was just imitating. That's, you know, three or 400 years later, Huang Tingjian making this claim about Dufu. Uh, sure. Second, I think that whether or not Im their imitation is really what we would qualify today as moderns as imitation is kind of splitting hairs and is not n not super relevant i mean when when confucius says he he transmits he's he's making a pretty clear claim when huang tingjian says that you know they never imit uh, they never they never created they only imitated his claim is is pretty clear su shi's claim is pretty clear and you know if if words like imitation can be translated at all and rob that's translations your neck of the woods not mine but if you can make this claim that words are translatable then i i think we just kind of have to take that at face value and sure there might be some kind of wiggle room in the these different words but essentially i i take susha and i take huang ting jin at their words and it sounds like you're trying to question their intent my my point would and this will be the one i close with is not that when they say imitation, they don't mean imitation at all. My Part of my point would be when they say imitation, they don't mean what we think of as imitation. And second, those within the culture who are a part of this tradition do have that understanding that what we are doing is not literally copying. What we are doing is honoring the tradition that came before us by using it in interesting and new ways. And that, to me, is innovation. The fact that it's not innovative the way we think of it doesn't mean that it's not encouraged. I guess my last thought would just be, it it could be imitative, but they are framing it as not imitative. That's the difference. Rob, I think that's a great place to end it. Yeah, because you got the last word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.